Good morning, church and friends online. Wish you all shalom and Emmanuel. Peace and God be with you. God, where are you when it hurts? Do you care? God, where are you when it hurts? Do you care? Did any, of, any one of you ever yell to God in such an anguished way? And we all know that the Israel people did in their slavery years. Because in Exodus, Exodus chapter 2, the Lord said this, I have seen, I have heard, and I'm concerned with the suffering of my people. Today's my theme of this, my sermon is the shalom or peace in the midst of suffering. In response to Pastor Apostles' sermon on Exodus chapter 2, two weeks ago. Let's spend some time on what shalom and suffering means. What's, what's shalom? Shalom translated into English is peace. But its meaning is much deeper and wider than peace. It means completeness or soundness, holistically, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And also it means prosperity, tranquility, or no wars, and also harmony relationship with God and with fellow people. That means all you know, the good things that human beings want are all in the word shalom. Uh, that's why God's people, the Jews, they like to greet each other with this word shalom. And now you all understand why I like to start my preaching every time with this greeting, shalom and Emmanuel, because I like to give the best and all God's blessing to all of you. And you, you may wonder, is shalom possible in the midst of suffering? And my answer to you will be yes, 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 because King David said that in Psalm 23, that's all he said. My law is my shepherd. I shall not want. He lie me on green pasture, lead me to the still water. And then continue. And then he said, even though I'm in the shadow of the valley of death, I'm not afraid because the rod and the staff of my Lord is with me. You can see that. Actually, shalom is really what we need today because we are living in such a world full of sufferings as you have been experiencing in the, at least in the last year under the COVID-19. Well, what's the meaning of suffering then? What's your meaning? Well, I'm a simple-minded person. To me, I would define in a very simple way. It means pain. Whatever pain it is, it can be physical pain, mental pain, or spiritual pain. When the pain reaches above the threshold of a person, then the person will name it suffering. So suffering is a very subjective thing. And the person is in suffering, then he will know what you mean by suffering. Isn't it? And I'm sure you agree with me that men in general don't like to talk about suffering. We like to shy away, you know, from talking about it. For Chinese people, that's why the, um, the religions are all revolve around yeah, suffering avoidance and what? Prosperity seeking. But I can say this to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, as Christians, we have to face suffering squarely. Why? Because every time 
when we were when we hold the holy communion, the law has told us that we hold the holy communion what in remembrance of Him. That means in remembrance of His suffering. Well, the Easter is coming in three weeks' time, so every year, what does the Easter remind the world and especially we Christians of? Jesus suffering on the cross, isn't it? And for me as a GP, in my work, every day I'm faced people suffering. If I want to shy away from suffering, I may as well just hang up my stethoscope and ret and retire from my GP work. Okay, so you can see how relevant suffering is. In my work, I've seen a lot of people crumble, including Christians, in the midst of suffering. And I ask myself, why? There must be a number of reasons. And that's a topic we are going to explore together today. And in my sermon today, I'm, I'm going to um, talk, uh, divide into three main headings. First, I'm talking about be prepared mentally for suffering. Second, then I will talk about accept suffering at the heart level. And then lastly, I will talk about how to commit yourself in facing suffering. Let's bow our head and pray. Heavenly Father, O oh Lord our God, please open our ear today to hear your message on suffering and open our mind to understand it and open our heart to say Amen to what you're going to say to us. In the name of Jesus, I pray all this. Amen. Today I'd like to recommend you to read this book called A Grace Disguised. It's by a professor uh, called Jerry Sitter. And he, he is a professor of theology in a college. And one happy day, unexpected moment, a car accident happened. And that accident took away Jerry Sitter's sister's three generations. His, his, his mom, his wife, and his daughter. And he was left with two boys and one girl, young in their age, for him to bring up. This experience forced him you know, to search on the, on the reason why they are suffering. And I'm going to call and paraphrase some of his uh, you know, findings in his search. He raised profound questions such as, how does our response to pain guide us through or entrap us in the pain? What is God's relationship to human suffering? He did not minimize the problems of faith that suffering presents. He has questioned why the accident happened on him. Is God interested or lack of interest in his suffering? He has experienced the agony of loneliness and separation from a God who seems uncaring or unable to ease his pain. At the brain level, he, like many others, knows that man's pers perspective is limited compared to God's, but it's very hard at the heart level to continue trusting God as he did before and to believe that God will somehow bring him out into the light. He examined alternatives to Christian faith, but he found none. If there is no God, then can there be any meaning in life and in a life of suffering? Would men really want to live in a world where everyone gets exactly what he deserves 
good or bad, a world without pain, but also without grace. What bearing does Jesus' suffering have on his own suffering experience? What does it really mean to have faith in God? There are no simple answers, but simply considering these questions can honestly challenge his per pre his per、uh, his preconceived notions. It is a risk worth search. Professor Sisa has found, as have many others, that God gives undeniable grace to those who trust Him in their suffering. While we would be fools you not know, to seek suffering, it is hard to deny that if the suffering had not come, they would probably not have experienced the works of grace. That they later find so valuable. So today, I like to focus on the grace in disguised aspect in suffering. To start off, let's talk about be prepare mentally for suffering. And I know a lot of Christians never ever prepare mentally for suffering. And including church, sometimes they are a bit shy away from preaching or talking on the topic of suffering. But let's look at the Bible. What Jesus say in John chapter fifteen, verse one to two. Now, in these two verses, all right, I I can say this: literally, all Christians whose names, if their names. Are in the book of life of God. Okay, they all will face suffering at some point of their life. And there's no exception. Why? Because this two verse tells that even for non-fruitful Christians and fruitful Christians, they both will be what dealt with by the heavenly Father. For the non-fruitful Christians, you no, know, the verse. Told us that the heavenly Father would lift, or、uh, will、uh, cut off those non-fruitful branches. That means no more relationship with God. Now, but I don't. I am bit. You know、uh, how to say it.、Um, uh, you know I have reserved. You know、uh, regarding this、uh, translation, cut off, because if non-fruitful. Branches cut off from Jesus, right? Then where is the blessed assurance of salvation, right? So I go, I go back to the original Greek word, and it's "iro." And this original Greek word literally means what? To lift. That means the heavenly Father will lift that what non-fruitful branch off its original position to what? To a position that the branch can receive more sunshine, or more or better condition, so that the branch can start bearing fruit. You see, and for the fruitful branch, the same thing. I mean, the heavenly Father will what? Will also prune. Now you know, pruning causes suffering as well. Lifting the branch up off its original position also causes suffering. Okay. So, can you see that? For the sake of bearing fruit for Christians, the Heavenly Father will allow suffering fall upon them. If at this point you still like to question why, you know, the loving Heavenly Father would like, you know, to, to see suffering befallen on His beloved children, you will you will say this to God, I. As a what?、Well, as an earthly father, would not like to see my parents, my children suffer. Then Jesus will answer your question in the following way. Well, in John ten, now in Matthew ten twenty four, what did Jesus say? Jesus said, "What、well, the student cannot be above the teacher, 
The servant cannot be about the master, right? If the heavenly father, you know, would let his only begotten son to come to the world to suffer until the point of crucifixion, do you think that the heavenly father would not spare his beloved Christians to go through suffering? John 16, 33, what did Jesus say? He said, the world that we are living in is a well of sufferings. John 17, 14, Jesus said what? The world we are living in, what? Hates Jesus' disciples, that means Christians. Well, then in James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4, what did, what did James say? He said, suffering is there what? To make the Christian mature and complete. Well, you may ask, what does it mean by mature and complete? Now I would like to look at this from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. Paul said, and now these three remains, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest is love. Paradoxically, Christian faith and hope in God cannot grow well if only in the days of smooth life. It grows much better through what days of sufferings. Look at what King, uh, uh, King David said in Psalm 23 again. He said, when I'm in the, uh, in the shadow of the valley of death, I'm not afraid for the rod and the staff of the Lord was with him. You see, I'm not afraid. Tell us what? King David's faith, isn't it? And then continue, he will say that. And I believe what? The Lord will lay a table of victory for me in front of my enemy. And then he said what? And surely goodness and kindness Will, what? will follow me or pursue me, chase after me in the original Hebrew. All right? Can you see? These are hope, isn't it? He, can, he had to hope that better days will come. He will be out of the shadow of the valley. Right? right? So only through suffering that King David or anyone of, of us, our faith and hope can grow more beautifully. And then we come to love, okay? Jesus like to, like to look at love in relative to hate. Now, as what he said in Luke 16, verse 13, he said what? He said, no one can serve two masters. He will either love this one and hate the other one. Isn't it? So love and hate are relative. So through suffering, Christians' love for God can be purified. And also, not only the love for God, the Christians what? The, the list of his beloved. Uh, the, if the priority will be changed also through suffering, he will find out who and what should be in the top of his love list. Right? Now, from all this, can you see truly, you know, suffering is a grace in disguise from God. Okay, now I hope now you can be mentally, all right, prepared for suffering and also mentally recognize that suffering is a grace of God in disguise. Then we can come to the second point, be accepting suffering at your heart level. But do you know what? From the brain level down to the heart level, even though it's only 18 inches for an adult, every adult, but it may take someone's whole life to travel through from here to there. According to uh, Kubler Ross model of grief, from here to there, you know, the point of acceptance, 
the person go to, may go through four stages. Denial, resentment, bargaining, depression, and then acceptance. So dear brother and sister and friends, if you are caring for someone, or one day you will care for someone who is in suffering, please remember this and respect the person that he needs to take time to accept what he has to accept. All right? Before he can accept it, uh, his behavior and mood will fluctuate and will make it very hard for you to take care of. Okay? But thank God, our Heavenly Father, He not only understand and respect and allow time for his children uh, to go through from the man, man from the brain level to the heart level towards acceptance. He he he, he in fact help the, you know, the 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 Christian in suffering to reach acceptance behind the scene. How? The following four ways. God will connect the Christian in suffering or the person in suffering with some other people who have gone through suffering, uh, listening to their testimony, how they can overcome their suffering. God will let them, will connect them to someone who are gracious enough, right, to care for, for those sufferers, right, with their love. God will remind the suffering, the sufferer of you know, their past experience, how God has delivered them from their past suffering. And also, God will walk. God will remind him or prompt him of his word of promises in the Holy Bible, such as Psalm 23. Truly, you know, Psalm 23 verse 1 literally what set me free one morning when i'm still in the midst of suffering for some other people it may be it may be you know isaiah chapter 43 verse 19 the lord say that i will walk i will make a way i will make a river a stream in the dry desert isn't it all right then once you can accept it at the heart level, then you are in the position to go on to the next stage. Is what? Commitment in facing suffering. When you commit in facing suffering, you will be able to what? Start complaining against God like the Israel people in the, what, in the book Exodus, which you will uh, you know, hear past apostles preach on in uh, future weeks. And what's the end? What's the ending for the Israel people complaining? God banned them from entering what? The promised land of rest, right? So instead of complaining, in your commitment to suffering, you will what? You will try you know, to practice you know, the offering of praise or the sacrifice of praise as said in Hebrew chapter 13 verse 15. Well, what is the sacrifice of praise? I give you four examples, then you will understand. All right, look at Job in the book of Job. All right. He's a righteous man, but overnight he lost all his wealth, all his family members, only his wife left behind. And then his health one day was also taken away. He was suffering from very severe and, well, and uh, torturing skin disease. And his wife one day said to him, why don't you curse your God? He made you like this. And what did, what did Joseph reply to his wife? He said, 
The law gives, the law takes back. The law deserves all praises. That's sacrifice of praise. You look at the second example, Apostle Paul. When he was in the prison, facing the possibility of death sentence, what did he do? He prays and sang hymns, isn't it? To the point that it caused earthquake and all the door of the cells opened. All right? That's sacrifice of praise. And then you look at the poor woman in the first book of, uh, of Kings. All right? The poor woman, well, gave the last, the very last ounce of flour and oil to the prophet Elijah. Look at the poor woman in the gospel, Luke. He only have two coins left. And she what? She offered all the two coins in the offering in the temple. So now do you understand what the sacrifice of praise means? It means that in the midst of suffering, you still use, you still what? Pray. Do, you know, to praise God in prayer, in words, in hymns, or even what? In action. That's sacrifice of praise. Now, all those the above four examples prove to you that sacrifice of praise or praising in the midst, in the midst of suffering is biblical and possible. But you may ask, but is it effective in handling suffering? I will tell you, yes. Why? Because behind suffering is a spiritual battle. And the Satan, the devil, is behind the suffering. The suffering is from the devil. If the suffering is not caused by your own mistake, it's always from the devil, right? And that we can see this clearly in the book of Job in chapter 1, isn't it? It's told us clearly that there is a spiritual battle behind the scene in the spiritual room that the suffering fell on Job. And what did Apostle Paul said? Apostle Paul said this likewise. He said, we Christians are not fighting against the visible flesh, but fighting against the invisible what? principalities in the air. Okay? So, well, then you might ask, okay, why? Why does God allow suffering on Job, but not his wife? Simple. Because God knows that his, that his uh, uh, graces or resources uh, that has given to Job will be sufficient enough for him to walk, to get over the suffering and for his spiritual life to es es escalate to the next level. Isn't it? All right. When you can praise God, I tell you what, the door of the heavenly what, storehouse, storehouse will, will be cracked open by your praise. And God's resources will just fall upon you to lead you out from the shadow of the valley of death into light and life. And you can experience peace, joy, love, shalom, or, or grace in disguise through the suffering. And not only that, you're in the position that you can use your own experience of suffering to help other people or to walk with other people in suffering, out of their suffering. Can you see? That's why suffering allows by God. That's why today, God like all of you to know that we can all enjoy shalom in the midst of our suffering. If you are in your suffering now, currently, or one day in the future. Today, for me to close um, uh, my sermon, I'd like to use the story in John 6. What's John 6 about? It's about Jesus performing, you know, the miracle, feeding 5,000 people with five bread and two fishes. And after the miracle and Jesus has departed, 
and the Jews try to seek for Jesus. Why? They try to seek for physical bread. But when they find Jesus, what did Jesus say to them? Jesus tell them the truth of, of the spiritual bread. And Jesus said, I'm the bread of I'm the bread of I'm the bread of life. My flesh can be eaten, my blood can be drunk. And those Jews, after they heard what Jesus said about himself, they thought, gee, this man must be a crazy man. Why would I follow this crazy man? So the whole crowd just left Jesus because Jesus' word offended them. And then Jesus said to his you know, close disciple and said, Well, can you see? The, you know, all the people left me because my word offended them. Do my word offend you? You can follow them and leave me. But what the apostle Peter said, he said, To whom? We shall go. You have the you have the word of eternal life, and we know and have belief that you are the Holy One of God. Yes, Professor Caesar said the same thing. He said he tried to explore alternative to Christian Christian faith, but he found none. Dear brothers and sisters. If you are currently in suffering, or one day when you face suffering, would you like to? Would you follow the uh, the you know, the Israelites in the book Exodus and complain about God, complain about about other people, or you will you will be, you will follow Peter and also Professor Caesar's example and declare declare praise to God. The God to whom we shall go. You have the word of eternal life. And we know and have believed that you are the Holy One of God. Let's bow our head and pray. Oh, Lord Holy Spirit, help us to pre pre prepare mentally for unexpected suffering in life because we are living in a suffering world. Help us to believe that suffering is God, the Father's grace in disguise. And God's grace for us will be sufficient to carry us out of suffering in God's timing and in God's way. Help our lips to be able to offer sacrifice of praises to you and to sing as well with my soul with my soul. Anoint us wisdom, O Lord, as in James 1.5, so that we can still experience joy and peace, shalom, in the midst of our current and future sufferings. In the name of Jesus, I pray this. Amen. <music>